Hi everyone, welcome to the launch of The Case for Remote Work, a new briefing paper from the Entrepreneurs Network written by Dr. Matt Clancy. Matt is an assistant teaching professor at Iowa State University where he specializes in the economics of innovation with a particular focus on agricultural innovation. Before he joined Iowa State, he was a research economist at the US Department of Agriculture where he focused on science policy. He's also the author of one of my favorite newsletters, New Things Under the Sun, which covers the incredible flourishing of academic research on innovation, science, creativity, and technological progress. Discussing this new report with Adam, uh, with Matt, will be Rory Sutherland and Adam Ozimek. Rory Sutherland is the Vice Chairman of Ogilvy in the UK, role which he describes as an attractively vague job title which has allowed him to co-found a behavioural science practice within an ad agency. Before founding the behavioural science practice, he worked as a copywriter and creative director at Ogilvy for over 20 years. You may know him from his TED Talks or his regular column in The Spectator. He is the author of two books, The Wiki Man and Alchemy, The Surprising Power of Ideas. He recently wrote a piece with Matt Lesh of the Adam Smith Institute, arguing that there are many positives to the rise of remote work and that the UK may be disproportionately well placed to profit from the shift. Finally, we've got Adam Ozimek, who is a chief economist at Upwork, the world's largest freelancing website. Before joining Upwork, he was a senior economist at Moody's Analytics and used to write the popular Forbes blog, Model Behaviour. His research has been covered in the New York Times, Washington Post, Bloomberg and the Wall Street Journal. Most recently has published reports arguing remote work will shift jobs out of high priced US cities and bridge the geographic opportunity gap, as well as releasing survey data finding that of those employed in the US pre COVID-19, about half are now working from home. If you want to understand the labour market implications of remote work in particular, I can't think of a better economist for the job. So to kick off the discussion, Matt will run us through the key findings of his report after which Rory and Adam will have an opportunity to respond and discuss their own research and ask questions. So without further ado, over to you, Matt. Thanks, Sam, and thanks a lot for the opportunity to talk about remote work. Uh, so the report is basically an attempt to pull together a lot of different threads that have been out there and were sort of uh, fermenting from before COVID-19, uh, all related to remote work, but which I kind of felt like hadn't been all put together in one place. And so, the case for remote work was sort of a lot stronger, I thought, than people really kind of realized because they might focus on one or the other, but there's actually all these different threads that sort of are mutually supporting each other. And so I kind of focus on four in the report. Uh, the first one is just, does remote work work in the sense that uh, can you get your stuff done productively in the office? And there's all these uh, papers that I sort of summarize and walk through that do experiments and other things that show that actually if anything, these remote workers are more productive than the people in the home office in lots of these studies. Uh, and then, you know, that's kind of short term and we've all had with COVID-19 an experience, uh, a chance to try remote working and people have kind of found that it actually does seem to work pretty well. So it's been kind of a nice validation of all that academic work. But there's kind of these new fears about what about the long run? Like uh, in the long run, people need to sort of meet each other, have serendipitous encounters and you just can't replace that over zoom or something like that and so people worry that it's going to slow innovation and creativity in the long run so the second part is sort of tackling or there's a part that tackles that sort of head on and looking at all this research on how important is it to be actually physically near other people to sort of learn from them and i'm an economist who works on innovation stuff so you know there's lots lots of literature that sort of shows across a bunch of different ways of measuring it that it doesn't matter as much as it used to, to be near other people, to learn from them, to get their ideas. And so sort of the advantage of cities that comes from this, you know, bubbling up of new ideas is sort of declining because you can access so many of those ideas remotely now through the internet or just through occasional travel. So, you know, those two things sort of say, all right, the advantages of being in the office are not what they used to be. And maybe remote work is just as good or maybe even a little better or anyway, very close. But if you really want remote work to take off, it's not enough for it to be almost as good as work in the office. It has to be better in some other way. Otherwise, why would firms make the switch? Because we're economists, you know, they want to maximize profit. Um, and so the second part of the report focuses on sort of two major trends that make remote work, you know, they give an advantage to remote work. And the big idea is that with remote work, you can, one of them is you can access this really large labor pool. So you can, you're not limited to just who's in your local city. You can get kind of the best person in the country for the role instead of just the best person in a commuting zone around your city. And 
you know, that's always, I guess, been possible, but it's a lot easier to find those people than it used to be thanks to just the general diffusion of the internet. Like even 20 years ago, less than half of people were using, you know, had access to the internet. We've got the rise of online labor markets like uh, Upwork, which Adam works at, and those things are getting more sophisticated. They've got algorithms to help you match uh, workers to firms and firms to workers. And then third is just so much of our life is now moving online that, you know, to the extent that I rely on people I know to help me find jobs, a lot of people I know are now living far away from me and I keep in touch over all these other forms of communication. Uh, so all of that kind of adds up that it's easier to find like the right person for a job who's not close uh, compared to how it was in the past. And that's a key advantage of remote work when remote work is sort of work from anywhere and not just uh, home three days a week and in the office two days a week. And then the last one is just that uh, it's not all about the productivity of an individual in the office. Since we're economists, we also have to think of the cost side of the equation and what do you have to pay people uh, you know, to get that productivity? Because it's more expensive to live in cities and more expensive to have co-located workers. You have to have office space. Uh, you have to usually compensate them for a higher cost of living. And you also have to compensate them for all these other things like uh, moving away from where they would prefer to live. And so we talk about some research that you know people value the ability to live near their friends and family in the range of, I'm from the US, so tens of thousands of dollars. And we also talk about um, just the option, like people just seem to like to work remotely, or at least a lot of people do. And you know they'll take less pay for the opportunity to do that. And that doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, we're cutting the costs of the firms and uh, we're just getting sort of cheap labor. It can also mean that for the same wage that you would pay somebody in the city, you can attract a better candidate who's somewhere far away and enjoys the ability to live like near their friends and family and who wouldn't normally come work for you for that. So that's kind of the four elements we focus on is like the advantage of remote work is you can kind of get more value for your dollar because you can get better workers for the position uh, from a big labor market, you can find them. And the advantages of being in the office are declining, like the technology has gotten so good that you don't really need to be there to do productive work anymore. The knowledge spillovers that used to be so important are now much more accessible online or through travel. And so that kind of tilts the balance. And I argue that basically that tilts the balance in favor of remote work. And, you know, the experiment with COVID-19 Remote work uh, seems to support that. Lots of firms have tried it and are basically going to stick with it. Uh, and you know, the last part of the report is sort of saying, this is a thing that we can actually look forward to. It's not a bad thing that we're all moving out of the office. Like it's good for regional inequality. It's good for uh, possibly the environment, depending on how the travel shakes out. And uh, it could even be good for sort of national productivity if you can get lots of people collaborating who wouldn't normally be able to collaborate because they live so far away from each other. So that's the report in brief and I'll hand it off then. Cool. Um, Rory, do you want to come in on that and sort of, I want to hear your thoughts, uh, especially on the sort of collaboration point, I guess, working in an ad agency, there's quite a premium on collaboration on sort of bouncing ideas off each other. It seems to be one much less than we thought. And I've got a very interesting take on this, which is that I think before COVID happened, everybody pretty much believed that they personally would be better off and would be better working remotely. What they didn't believe was that the whole thing could work at scale. And so the decision to work remotely beforehand was essentially seen as being selfish which is, oh, it's all right for you, but what about the rest of us? And what this is suddenly, this extraordinary forced experiment has taught us, is that it does work extremely well at scale. What's more, many of the things that work better are not those which we anticipated. So this isn't just my experience from Ogilvy, it's from a client, um, Suntory, the Japanese distilling firm, who said that you know it, they had never thought for a second that brainstorms might be better online than they were face to face. And yet ideation seems to work very well. Um, I think, I mean, we ought to remember that I think all three of us here that you've invited are basically advocates and evangelists for remote work. And it, okay, so let's take the sort of countervailing view. I was reading a piece by Ricardo Hausmann um, at Harvard, who 
had this absolutely dire prediction of what happens to world economic growth if there's no longer any business air travel. And his figure in terms of the value of information exchange runs into the trillions. And what seems very strange for an eminent man like that is he's done the cost analysis, but not the benefit. By which I mean he's more or less making the assumption that because we can't fly and see each other, then this information exchange will completely stop. And I would argue that the overall evenness and speed of information exchange, in particular the evenness of its spread, is going to increase in velocity and in range quite significantly. Now, let's just briefly take, let's pretend we're Marshall McLuhan for a second. <laughs> you know, um, what I think is obvious if you look at the, the range or the gamut of person-to-person -person media, okay, including face-to-face, -face, by the way, and including everything from organised meetings to taking people to the rugby. There was this yawning gap between face-to-face, -face, which was rich, hot, perhaps, as McLuhan would have said, um, you know, very warm, high, you know, highly rich in terms of nuance, but also mind-blowingly expensive. OK, so if you attach a media cost to a face-to-face -face meeting. We tend to talk about media in cost per thousand in advertising, okay? And, a, you know, a TV commercial might cost £50 for a thousand people. A face-to-face -face meeting with one person for which you have to take a taxi, if you, if you deploy the same media metric, actually has a CPM of about £50,000, okay? It's monumentally expensive compared to reaching people in digital form. And... As a result, it's what we were living in before this revolution happened was a bit like a world where there were buses and there were limousines, but there was absolutely nothing in the middle. So you had cold media like email, the telephone call, which is, you know, audio only. Uh, you know, you had Slack, all these textual devices, which were free and universal. And then you had this yawning gap where there was no hot media until you got to face to face. And so I see this as filling an incredibly necessary gap in the market. I also see it as a necessary, what I would call Georgist technology. Now, I don't know how Georgist the other three, you know, the other three of you are. Um, but the idea of Henry George is that particularly in an economy where economic activity has to be geographically concentrated for reasons of specialism or information exchange, the landowner ends up essentially gaining, it's a bit like airport retail, okay? The landowner effectively ends up sucking away most of the economic gains created on his space, okay? Because he has monopoly power. And okay, there are anti georges technologies like the skyscraper, I guess. And I think it's always interesting to look at technological trends and look at them and say, are they centrifugal or centripetal? In other words, do they disperse, do they reduce the power of the landowner or do they increase it? And probably over the last 30 or 40 years, we've had a lot of centri centripetal forces. So jet air travel creates very valuable information transfer, but concentrates it absurdly in a kind of winner takes all uh, economy uh, where the megalopolis wins out disproportionately. I'll just take my pattern of air travel to the United States in my in my entire working life. I don't know how many times I've been to New York. OK, I, I can't. I, it's something like 28. OK, I've probably been to Chicago four times, Los Angeles four times, San Francisco twice. Uh, and then everywhere else in the US is either one visit or zero. Now, OK, New York's more important than San Francisco. Oh, sorry, than Kansas City. OK, or San Francisco, because it's bigger. OK. But it's not 30 times more important. And so air travel is very anomalous because actually it disproportionately, the very hub and spoke model disproportionately leads to a few winner takes all cities dominating the kind of international knowledge economy. And then there are other technologies, which I, you know, another thing which would be highly centripetal, the dual income household, by the way exerts a very strong force on people moving to enormous cities because otherwise one of you is suffering a major career setback by dint of anybody moving anybody else, anywhere else. Okay. Um, by the way, the fall in crime in large cities, 
Um, you could argue that one way to solve the property crisis in London is to import the Gambino family and give and ask for some advice on how you could make London a more scary and violent place. Um, the fall in pollution, which used to be a very strong centrifugal force. And so there seem to be an enormous number of forces which drive everybody into these enormous cities and, by the way, higher education. Because once you've invested, in the case of the US, $150,000 in your education, you've pretty much got to move to New York to make it pay. All right. And so air travel leads to this incredibly uneven dispersion of, uh, of talent. And I'll end with two things, one of which, which is a theory of mine, and I'm going to call it Sutherland's Law, is that on Zoom, practically everybody on the planet with an expertise, apart from, say, Tony Blair, Barack Obama and Bill Clinton, OK, maybe not Nobel Prize winning economists, who I know are the greediest public speakers of the lot, OK, but everybody else will give an hour of their time on Zoom for a thousand dollars or less. Because to me, to give an hour of my time on Zoom means it's a commitment of an hour. If I commit to go to Amsterdam to deliver a talk, the opportunity cost is enormous. One, it's two days of my life involved in travel or a day and a half. I now can't go on holiday that week because I've committed to go to Amsterdam. All these things impose this incredible obstacle on information exchange. Whereas, to be honest, if someone says it's 800 bucks, mate, and we want you to talk for an hour, I'm ecstatic because I can wander in from the beach in Barbados, deliver my <laughs> information exchange, and then just go back to, I'd probably have to put on a shirt, right? And I'll end with the funniest story of all in terms of geographic spread of wealth. If Zoom had existed in 1963, Decker would have hired the Beatles, okay? Because Decker, the Beatles played their audition set in Decker in London. I think it was New Year's Day, either 62 or 63. And they decided instead to hire Brian Poole and the Tremolos, who weren't a bad band. They got a number one. One of the significant reasons they hired Brian Poole and the Tremolos, not the Beatles, was the Beatles were based in Liverpool. And it meant that every time you wanted to meet them, you'd have to pay for return train tickets. <laughs> you could probably say that's the most short-sighted bit of procurement in A&R history. OK, we don't want these Liverpudlian people because the transport costs are going to be too high. But nonetheless, if you look at the effect and you, you imagine that effect magnified a millionfold, in terms of the value of information exchange, this is utterly brilliant. In, now, and I regard this as, by the way, it, the reason Londoners aren't going back, this is the world's first Schumpeterian strike. We've basically discovered a form of creative disruption, which we believe means we can deliver just as much value to our employers at far lower personal cost and far lower financial cost and potentially far less property cost. Because even if we're still going into the office two days a week, three days a week, the 4-3 ratio compared to the 5-2 ratio makes a very, very different decision about where you want to live. OK, because not only do you get less time having to commute into London, but you get more time being where you want to be. And we have a wonderful example at Ogilvy because we've just appointed a new chief executive who is based in Denver. And I met him and I said, I'm terribly sorry, you know, you'll, you'll have to move to New York. I love the American West. It's fabulous. OK. And he said, I'm not moving anywhere. He's running the whole agency from Denver. I think he's absolutely right. It also sets a fantastic example for the rest of us. Because I think the failure, if we fail to actually capitalise on this extraordinary, almost accidental discovery, you know, we need to look at ourselves with a degree of shame. Because I, I think it's important in so many ways. I think it's genuinely, okay, very simple. Sorry, sorry, I've been going far too long. Standard labour economics says people have spare time. They sacrifice their spare time, leisure, for labour and the employer pays them compensation to pay for the time they've lost. If you have a more psychologically nuanced approach, what you realise is that I think, first of all, labour nowadays is not gruelling and backbreaking. I don't arrive covered in coal dust, you know, home from the, the PowerPoint mine, OK? But the second thing is, what people actually value more than they may value even free time is what I call free, free when and free where which is autonomy, which is the right to work when you like in the day and the right to work where you like 
are probably more valuable to people than the right to work shorter hours. And once you factor those two extra variables in, you have this incredibly valuable new value exchange, which is don't pay people with, with less work, which is one solution. Don't pay people with more money. Pay them with the same money, but with free when and free where. Everybody wins. Adam, we've spoken a bit about the sort of uh, the, ge the ge geographic effect, the sort of uh, regional inequality effect. I th you, you've got a really great paper on that. So maybe you can talk a bit about that now. Sure. So uh, I, I really like Rory's point. That this is a, the Georgia's technology and the centrality of landowners in this and land rents in this, I think is really important. And it's a really under discussed part of remote work. And, you know, what good, everyone knows that cities are sources of agglomeration and productivity growth and high earnings. Um, and, you know, I think that's one of the fears about remote work is that it's going to lean against that. What I say is what good is all that agglomeration? What good is all that productivity growth if it all just flows to, to, to landowners and rents? And so that's when you're thinking about who benefits and who loses here it's really it's a complicated you know spatial equilibrium problem and i don't have very specific answers in terms of like do the suburbs outside the city benefit more because now you know you can commute in one day a week so the hour long car drive is suddenly you know much less costly so maybe you it's much more desirable to live in the suburbs on the other hand people who wanted to access to the to the city labor market, um, but don't care for the city consumption amenities, those are the people who seem most likely to go remote and go you know, farther away. And where they're living right now is generally the suburbs. So where does the incidence within metro area fall, I think is a very complicated question. Uh, it's something I'm thinking a lot about and working on, and I don't really have an answer for it yet. But what I do think is pretty clear is where the incidence is going to fall is on land rents. So whether those land rents are in the suburbs or in the cities, I think we're going to see a narrowing in the cost of living between the most expensive parts of the country and the rest of the country. And it really is this, this strange distribution where like if you look at you know, average house prices, um, you have a tail where like it's like really low and then most places are in the middle and then like the top 15 places, it just gets extraordinarily expensive. And so I think those most expensive places are going to see, uh, you know, the biggest hit from remote work. Now, what will that hit look like? I think that's going to vary place to place. And one important factor here is that housing is extremely inelastic in a lot of these places, meaning that strong demand um, has not translated to a lot more building, but has translated to uh, much higher house prices over the last 10, 20 years or so. And so if that's what it looks like when you ride up the supply curve, not a lot more people, a little bit more people, but a lot more prices, when you ride back down the supply curve because demand shifts leftward, you're gonna see the same sort of unraveling, which is that it's gonna primarily manifest in lower prices, less so in lower population. So I think that that's probably what we're gonna see in to think about the strongest hit places, New York, San Francisco, and two Another, to a probably slightly lesser extent, but still true, uh, Washington, D.C., I think we're going to see a bigger change in cost of living than we are in overall population. But because population was trending down in those places anyway, I do think we'll probably see some population loss. So I think that has a lot of geographic implications. But I think one of the, the key questions to all of this, um, and this is something that Matt got out a lot in his paper, and I'd be curious to hear some more about and sort of hear you explain is, is the issue of agglomeration, I think, is so central to this. And it's the first thing that economists sort of their minds drift towards when they think about remote work. And I think, I think it's important because there's really two kinds of um, costs and benefits here. There's the costs and benefits to the firm and the worker, which are private, and there are the costs and benefits to that are sort of wider spillovers. Now, I always find it kind of amusing when people start to worry about the cost and benefits to the firm. They're like, well, remote work's going to be bad for the economy because businesses are going to learn that, um, you know, training people is hard and like it's hard to get, give promotions and do promotions and like 
you know, just, you know, do you have these agglomeration effects within the office that, you know, popping in people's offices is so important. Like, why are we worrying about this? These are firm problems. They're going to figure this out. Like there, the endogeneity works there, right? There is no sense in which we have to worry that remote work is going to cause firms to make mistakes, right? All the private benefits between the firm and the business, they're going to sort that out. And if it works for 10% of firms, then that's positive for productivity growth. If it doesn't work for 90% of productive firms, it's irrelevant because they're not going to do it, right? So even if you were to do like an experiment, we randomly assigned remote work to 100 firms and one out of 10 firms saw productivity benefit and nine out of 10 saw massive productivity decline, it's irrelevant. It's actually good for productivity, right? Because those nine out of 10 can just stop doing it and the one out of 10 can continue doing it and now productivity and aggregate has gone up. So I don't think though those are serious concerns that economists should worry about that much, except to the extent that it will affect the um, adoption of remote work, which is obviously a relevant question. But I think that the bigger question is what happens to, you know, these sorts of spillovers within cities. You know, agglomeration is very important for cities. Knowledge builders are very important. We see these as being, you know, a significant determinants of aggregate productivity growth for the economy overall. Um, I think Matt does a really nice job in the paper of talking about how agglomeration benefits actually these spillovers have declined somewhat over time using a variety of data sources. Um, but I think one of the things I'd like to hear him dig into a little bit is how do we reconcile the, the decline in agglomeration over time with the fact that more and more knowledge workers have sort of piled into these cities and the fact that they continue to receive a growing premium to do it. So the premium to skilled work in dense cities has gone up despite the agglomeration benefits going down. How, how can we reconcile those things? Yeah. So the way I think about that is that, um, you know, firms think of a firm trying to decide if they want to go remote, hire a remote position or a, or a, a co-located, which is what I call it in the paper worker. Um, you know, at the outset, like it doesn't matter if remote work is, uh, like 50% as good as being in the office or 95%, like if they're going to do whichever is better. And so for until recent history, like until very recently, being in the office, they all decided was better. And even though remote work was getting more productive over that time period, it still wasn't, at least they didn't perceive it to be as good. And so everybody decided to people have people in an office. And then if you're going to have them in the office, you might as well locate the office in a place that they can all enjoy spillovers because you got to put it somewhere. And so I think that's, you got kind of this, you know, self-propelling thing. And then on the other side, like if all the firms are making that decision, then that means all the people are in the same place and the benefits of being remote are maybe not, I don't know, like the benefits of being in the office are basically as strong as they can be because like everybody's there and, and so on. But all through that time period, like remote work is getting better and better and better. And uh, at the same time, like there are limits to how much benefit you can get out of the city. And San Francisco seems like it was really like approaching those limits in terms of like house prices. And you just hear these crazy stories about what it was like to try to move there and live there. Uh, and so at some point, people realized like at some point remote work becomes better. And then you get kind of this stuck position where like there's a transition cost. And so uh, you have to re redo your whole office to make it work remotely. And I think that also prevents that like allows the advantage of remote work to kind of keep stacking up higher and higher until it kind of like the dam breaks, which in this case, you know, when I wrote the paper, I thought that this would play out over decades and then COVID-19 kind of accelerated everything really quickly because suddenly everyone was forced to make that transition. And, and another thing is economists always sort of assume that firms know exactly what they're doing and they're profit maximizing. And I think that's true to like a, a long run approximation, but I think they do make systemic, like, like your own work, I think is really interesting in terms of uh, people who find remote work went better than expected, which we sort of wouldn't think firms should be able to be surprised. Like they should, we often think that they know exactly the best, most profit maximizing way to run their business. But uh, in fact, like they just, it's not easy to just try remote work and see how well it works. And so there's this, there could be like a low hanging fruit that nobody's grabbing. Uh, and then the last thing is uh, throughout that whole period, like even though tech workers were agglomerating in these cities, like remote work was actually just continually ticking up through this whole period. And like it went up from in the US, like 2% of the of workers to 5% uh, by 2018, which is, you know, still small share, but 
there's a lot more people than that uh, doing it now. And even that number 5% was like an understatement. If you, again, I'm just telling you your own work. Like if you look at, if you survey it right. There, there, there was actually a lot of remote work before COVID, but it was a bit like being gay in the US military in the 1980s. It was done on the basis of don't ask, don't tell that you, station car parks near me in the suburbs were basically half empty on a Friday. Okay, so it was clearly going on, particularly on Fridays to a large extent, but nobody was very open about it. And I think there's something very interesting, which is you're absolutely right. You saw it when you wrote the paper as playing out over a decade or so. Apparently in the UK, the Department for Transport had the same prediction. They had built in a prediction that video conferencing in particular um, would start to diminish the demand for transport, but all their projections had it about 10 years in the future. And what I think normally you would have seen is that sigmoid curve where something grows slowly at first and gradually tips. And of course, a lot of new technologies, network technologies, have this problem, which is that it's the critical mass problem. I always give an example. If mobile phones hadn't been interoperable with the landline phone network, had you only been able to call other mobile phones, the growth of the mobile handset, the, the, gro the growth of the mobile telephony would have been 10 years later. You know, I had a mobile phone very early. For the first five years, it was very rare that you called someone else on a mobile to the extent that you almost commented on it when you had a mobile to mobile call. Wow, like we're both moving about. And so I think the interesting thing was that um, in many ways, the open plan office set back the adoption of this because an open plan office is a wholly unsuitable place in which to hold a video call. And the open plan office deserves far more harsh critique than it receives because uh, there was a Harvard study, I think, which showed that the use of email goes up when you make everybody's open office open plan because you can't talk privately. And in fact, you can't talk loudly without disturbing people. So in fact, the volume of cold communication, to use McLuhan again, it makes communication colder. And of course, you, if then, by the time I've traveled into the office to attend a physical meeting, okay, well, you know, <laughs> To have a remote meeting would require me to book a meeting room, set up a camera. Well, to be honest, I might as well make it a physical meeting. It's only when I don't have to commute in the first place that the benefits really become salient. Um, so I, I found this the most unbelievable kind of accidental discovery, if you like. And I think the economic importance of it in terms of productivity um, is, I mean, and, and as you make the point about just, I've had a more international life since I haven't left Kent in that I talk to offices of Ogilvy, like Tbilisi in Georgia, where the odds that I ever would have visited them by air were vanishingly small. You know, I, um, the, the meetings are, you know, more diverse. In, in some respects, they're better. We don't, by the way, fully know why. But one of the things I get annoyed by is people who only notice the downside without calculating in the up. And so when somebody says to me, you know, it's not the same, is it? You know, talking to someone over a screen, it's not the same. I always go, well, yeah, but I wouldn't want to go to the cinema with you. You know, I don't want to be sitting next to you watching Jaws. And you're going, yeah, I mean, it's quite an interesting film, but it's not the same as actually being in a ship off the New England coast <laughs> while being attacked by a giant shark. The fact is, as humans, you know, maybe in common with higher primates, we have this thing called imagination. And particularly, we're largely visual and auditory. When, you know, dogs, I don't think video conferencing would work very well. I think they probably do need the sense of smell. But humans, by and large, I don't think anybody's really flown me out to a conference in Amsterdam so they can smell me. <laughs> and, um, in this case, the obvious savings that in terms of convenience, in terms of just three productive hours added to your day every single day, um, I'm prepared to take a small loss in terms of intimacy uh, in order to, to enjoy those gains. Yeah, I would just jump in also to say that, um, like, if I'm going to have less intimate interactions, like, I would prefer to, to be no offense to my coworkers than with sort of my family who I've moved away from to, to be, you know, uh, so I can pursue a job. And that's, that's exactly my life. I lived in, I moved to London. I lived there for a couple of years. I've lived in Washington, D.C., and now I'm back in Iowa. And, uh, you know, it's, it's nice to be able to see those people face to face. And I don't know, the freedom of remote work to do that also is, is 
I don't know, underrated, I think. And people focus a lot on the isolation and you don't get the same social exper experience with people in the office, but there are trade-offs, I think. I think there will be in terms of property. I think young people still have a reason to move to large cities. And I think that one of the great problems about the property market and agglomeration and this Georgist failing is not that young people are moving to cities. It makes sense for them to do so. You maximise opportunity, you maximise serendipity. There's also a kind of Darwinian mate, mate search element to a city, let's be honest. You know, and you can technologically substitute that only up to a point. OK, so there are lots of reasons, I think, for young people at the beginning of their lives. I think the problem has been caused by the fact that the middle aged haven't been moving out. And so this business where young people, cities are fed by the young, maybe the super wealthy, arguably, if you're super wealthy, you know, it is very interesting that there are many Londoners who are worth several. And this will be true in San Francisco. People who are worth literally tens of millions of pounds who objectively have a lower quality of housing than someone below median income in Iowa. Certainly, if you factor in the garden into it, that wouldn't be uncommon. I mean, there are people who spend four million pounds on an apartment in London who don't even get a place to park a car. Now, to an Iowan, that would be, you know, practically the gulag, wouldn't it, if you didn't have a parking space? That's right. And so it is, but maybe the super rich, you know, because why wouldn't you? Maybe there will also be a group of people who buy tiny accommodation in London and have a larger place somewhere else. So it could lead to, whether desirable or not, an increase in that thing that all writers always say, he divides his time between. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so the reaction will be complicated. I think that older people will increasingly want to move out more, partly because you're not at that stage of your career where, uh, you know, opportunity maximization is everything. You kind of know by the time you're 45 what you're gonna be doing for the next 10 years. And you've also established, by the way, more, more reputational currency with which to do it. So I think we might see an age divide in terms of the people who move from the centre to the suburbs and the people who move from the suburbs further out. But no. that city is doing what they should be doing, really, which is being really exciting places for young people. And I think even, you know, one of the, the groups that's been harmed the most over the last 10 decades of skyrocketing house prices in addition to, like you say, young people being priced out. So young people though, they do have the advantage and they can live like eight of them, right? And you can live on like like 150 square feet and cr cram into apartment. The re another, but like a big tax has been to people who have families and they wanna, they wanna ac and, you know, access to agglomeration. So if you want like that high paying career in you know, marketing, design, law, uh, software development and any of these, sort of agglomeration industries, you move into the city, that's tough, you know, because you, you want to have kids, um, you know, that takes space. And it's really uh, agglomeration, the agglomeration tax is proportional to the square footage of space that you need. So if you want to have a family having access to those cities, or even if you don't want, even if you just want to live in the city, I mean, like, some people just love living in cities. A lot of people do. And if you just love New York City yeah. and you want to stay there and you're not, you know, not that concerned about the career effects, like this is going to be great for you because it's going to make it much more affordable for you to actually have a family. I mean, my hunch would be that there's a bunch of people who are stuck in New York and London, not because they want to live there, but partly because in all the time property was going up so dramatically, you felt that as soon as you left, you were missing out. And indeed, you were frightened that you'd never be able to move back in again. And so that probably increasing house prices, ironically, in some senses, drove agglomeration because it created a reluctance to leave. And I, I know that sounds completely contrary to all conventional economic theory, for which I apologize. But there, you know, if you think about loss aversion, uh, you know, the fear of moving out that once you do it, you'll never be able to move back. And then there's also the path dependency that once you've been in a large city for 15 years, you probably end up with a job title that's so specialized that you can't perform it anywhere else. So if you think about it, my job title of vice chairman of an advertising agency is a job title that only really exists in London, New York, Singapore. You know, I could make a stab of it in Chicago. But after, you know, after I reel off 10 very large cities, Sydney, yeah, I could probably do it there. After I reel off those 
highly agglomerated cities, I've basically run out of employers. And so there's, a, there's an extraordinary extent to which the specialisation that's made possible with agglomeration makes it impossible to escape. Yeah, I think that has important implications that the specialisation thought, not just for, you know, we tend to focus on how remote work lets workers live where they want, but there's also tremendous implications for entrepreneurs and people who would start companies. So if you wanted to, Rory, move to Iowa and start a marketing company, it's tough because you need to hire staff and it, you know, it reduces the entrepreneurship rates of these places, especially parts of the country where population and working age population are declining. So it's not just that it's hard to find people, but you know, it's going to get harder in the future because these places are shrinking. They have very low rates of entrepreneurship. They have very low rates of startup um, startups. And there's a, a very robust relationship between population growth per se and entrepreneurship. And I think it's, you know, the literature suggests that it's because of this labor force thing where you want to know you can hire workers. And if a place is shrinking, you basically have to hire the few workers that are there away from existing companies. Um, whereas remote work, now you have the ability to grow a company without those sorts of limits. And so I do think that that will be a sort of unspoken positive benefit of this is growth of entrepreneurship in sort of struggling places, lower cost of living places. Yeah, and I would just pop in, sorry, Sam, that uh, I think it's interesting to imagine what this might even do to the types of jobs you can do if you can specialize more and more because you can sell, like, I think it seems like Upwork is sort of doing that where people maybe could specialize in a very niche skill that like even a firm doesn't really need full time for, for this kind of thing, but you can sell that talent all over the world now and really focus on sort of a job that wouldn't have been possible in the past. Uh, yeah. Funnily enough, I can back that up because I was a Zoom and remote working advocate about two years ago before this even happened. And so I, with my own team, I performed experiments, which I, I, the fact that the rest of free market capitalism completely failed to do this always strikes me as a bit of a blind spot. One of the things I first discovered is when I told my team, you're free to work remotely, nobody did. And then I realized they were framing that as a concession and they felt they were burning reputational currency every time they took advantage of it. It was only when I said, no, no, you don't understand. I actually want you to work from home one day a week. That was the only point at which it took off. When I said, you know, this isn't a concession, it's actually a request. Um, that was one interesting finding, uh, certainly. Um, I, I, and I think, by the way, we'll continue to experiment. Um, one of the things I've always said is if you want ideation, because of the sunk costs of travel and, and coordination, we tend to try and have a half day brainstorming session. And I go, to be honest, two of them, two hours long with a week in between, the first part being immersion, then you leave people to kind of ferment on the ideas and then you have hardcore ideation at the very end would be a much more effective way to do it. But we've always done these things as, and likewise, we ought to look at things like, you know, the whole business conference trade fair market, which in many ways is also agglomerative. But also, um, if you think about it, you tend, if you hold any kind of business conference, you're desperate for senior people to attend. And the very people who could learn the most from the conference are priced out, you know, and, What's fantastic about online conferences is people can watch them from anywhere. They're always held in bloody London or, you know, occasionally you held them in Cannes or in the US, it's always Vegas or one of the New Orleans or one of those kind of conference cities. And they're always in one of five places. They're impossible to travel to, to anybody who's more junior and they're wildly expensive to attend. And the fact that that knowledge can now be democratized, we had a, we had a conference nudge stock on behavioral science and we were forced to go virtual. And the peak hour of a 14 hour one day worldwide conference starting in Australia and ending in Hawaii, we had 120,000 views. <laughs> we're going, hold on, that's the Super Bowl. I mean, not, not in TV terms, but in stadium terms, that is an insanely large audience. And so the idea that somehow moving things from air travel to Zoom or to, you know, Teams is somehow in an inhibition to information exchange seems absurd. I was just, um, I was just wondering what you guys think, um, will, what 
whether remote work will mean homework in the future. So are we going to just sort of see the death of offices, you know, much fewer offices, or is it going to be the case that I'm going to go to a co-working space or coffee shops are going to basically become offices? Uh, what's going to happen on that front? Yeah, I think, um, I think we'll see a mix. I mean, I think there are, it, one of the things that people say about remote work and their skepticism of it is like, well, you need this socialization. And what I say to that is there's twofold. One is I think that you can, if you divide the world into introverts and extroverts, the extroverts see the socialization of the office of being a perk, the introverts seeing it as being a cost. And it, that's not really why we do it right? We don't do it because you enjoy the socialization. It's mostly been a choice about technology up to this point, but introverts see why this is, I like it. So that's why it exists. So it should probably still exist. And I think uh, introvert, as speaking as an introvert, I just like to let the extroverts of the world know that uh, just because it's, it's not the way you like it, that does not mean that's the way it's going to be in equilibrium. And, you know, we've had, uh, you know, since the growth of the modern office, we've had decades that have favored the extrovert preferences. And it could very well be the case that extroverts are simply the losers over the next few decades. And they just don't like it as much. And that doesn't mean it won't happen. But also to the extent that, you know, they really truly do need that and value it. There, there's co-working spaces everywhere. I mean, frankly, before the pandemic hit, the year before it hit, what we had was a glut of co-working spaces and giant co-working companies on the verge of collapse because they built so many co-working spaces. And it's very, they're very easy to make, they're very easy to build. So if for whatever reason you, you absolutely must have the water cooler, um, there's ways to get that on sort of, on, you know, on your own dime, actually. Yeah, so, I mean, one of the reasons that remote work, I think, is often more productive than working in the office is because it lets everybody, uh, optimize for their own personality type. So if you're a night owl, you can work late. If you're a person who likes to work and an introvert, you can work from home. And so I totally agree that you'll like, I'm like over the summer, I'm an academic, so I, I can essentially work from home. And I, before the pandemic, I would always work in a coffee shop half the day and work home half the day. And that's just my preference. And to me, that's like, that's bliss, but uh, you know, I don't like- well, we, can, we can respond to this also by creating more, more bifurcated office space. So people with, let's say, noisy households will want to go into the office or some office because it's a bit like a library and they can escape. And there'll be other people, particularly people who live alone who are extroverts, who will want the office to be a highly sociable space. And there's no reason now, given the space we've saved, that you can't provide space for both. But there was a love, there was, by the way, on the introvert rights thing, it's always been much easier for extroverts to bully introverts than the other way around. And there was a lovely meme at the very beginning of lockdown, which simply said on the internet, it said, introverts be nice to extroverts. They don't know how this works, <laughs> which I think was spot on. Uh, you know, and you're right that, that extrovert modes have dominated a lot of business culture um, unfairly for far too long. It's also worth saying, by the way, that one argument I occasionally hear is this is a bit unfair because only some people in some jobs can do it. And so the argument is it's unfair to people who work in shops because they won't be able to work from home. Well, A, to solve a property crisis, you don't need to solve the problem for everybody. You've just got to solve it for some, you know. Secondly, actually, manual labour does offer a far greater range of conditions of work, assuming you have the choice, OK? So manual labour does cater for a wider range of personality types, if you think about it, than office work does. You know, you can, you know, if you want camaraderie, you might want to become a scaffolder. If you want, you know, you can be a taxi driver if you like being alone. You know, there are different, you know, if, you, if you're a plumber, you can kind of work the hours you choose. And actually, office work has been unusually conformist, I think. So you know, assuming that people in more manual professions, and of course, there's the gig economy, which some people hate and some people actively choose because they value that autonomy. And... Um, introducing some level of, you know, freedom of choice of what kind of environment you like to work in to um, office and administrative work seems to me actually an equalizing act in some ways. 
And on the uh, also on the uh, the dominance of extroverts, I I also like the. I always wonder if that's one reason why there's so much skepticism about remote work from sort of basically successful people today who made it in the office. And so they were able to thrive in that environment and they can't imagine how it could be any other way. And so they write columns saying this is a big mistake Silicon Valley is making. Yeah. And I, I think also part of it, part of the like view of the office of being such a positive thing is based on just a, I don't want to call it a glitch, but like a, uh, an economic empirical issue, which is that we know agglomeration exists as an aggregate phenomenon, right? It's very easy to observe the fact that wages are higher in dense places for skilled workers. And so this sort of sets off a race to explain that. And that's what leads you to things like, well, why is it more efficient to be, or what, why are there productivity gains to being around people? And so it sets economics off in this uh, attempt to sort of measure the positive spillovers of closeness and where can we identify the positive spillovers of closeness and to view it as being this purely externality, positive externality driving thing. And, you know, where that starts is the easily observable aggregate agglomeration effects. That doesn't mean that there aren't all sorts of negative spillovers to work in the office too. So, you know, at Up Upwork, we have a survey, um, teacher workforce report where we in interviewed um, hiring managers uh, about how remote work is going. And so this is very different than interviewing workers because you're actually interviewing the managers who are making decisions. So their opinions, you know, carry a little bit more weight than you ask how workers are doing. And one of the top benefits they found of working remote, the benefits was less distractions in the office and fewer meetings. Now, why would it be the case that a worker would find that being in the office generated above optimal distractions and meetings? It's because you don't determine them privately, right? Your number of meetings is negotiated and in some sense imposed upon others. And so you have, and this is even more true when you're talking about pop-ins, right? When someone's dropping by your desk, that's not something you bought or sold in a market and paid a price for it. It, it's it's the the possible the potential for externalities there are obvious like someone is imposing meetings upon you someone is imposing pop-ins upon you so it seems to me that there's a very strong case for these sorts of externalities negative within the office we just don't pay much attention to them and haven't tried to measure them and don't talk about them as a result of the positive agglomeration at the city level that we sort of know and so that's why it's kind of gone ignored in the literature but i think from a like tragedy in the commons perspective, it's pretty obvious that like someone distracting you is a cost. And it's not just a magical Alfred Marshall, something in the air where, oh, it's, it's an amazing creative spark. Like it's not always an amazing creative spark. Sometimes it's a, you're trying to concentrate and someone's like popping in your office. And so I do think that what we're going to learn from remote work is that those costs are real and they're serious and they reduce productivity. And now all of a sudden we have like sort of a reason to think about them more, but I think that they've always been there. I was just wondering, um, we talked a bit about the, the sort of geographic inequality question, but I mean, one of the issues that I've seen raised by critics of remote work quite recently is the idea that maybe it will lead to jobs you know, going from London to Leeds or even to sort of smaller towns around the UK or whatever. But if you, if you can observe, if you're, if you can do remote work, why focus on the UK? Why not outsource to India where, you know, there's yeah. 1 billion people? What, what do you think we'll just, remote work will just sort of skip the, maybe it will skip the sort of smaller states of the US or to skip the sort of, that side of things and just go straight to why don't we hire people uh, where labor costs are, you know, a third of what they are currently. Why don't we just go international? I could take a shot. Yeah. Sure. Uh, so I, I think that like one reason remote work didn't take off as soon as it did is like one lesson I take from it is small frictions matter. Like uh, if it is hard to communicate, then that, people just don't like it and they don't do it. And so I think that there are still a lot of these small frictions that technology hasn't, uh, you know, like overcome for international work and basically like language and time zones are hard to like, they, they take a different strategy to overcome. They're not totally 
impossible, but like even the studies I've looked at, people find like there's time zone effects and it seems to be like much easier to work north, south, very far away than like east, west. And uh, and if you don't have like a shared, like if you're worried about trust and like camaraderie and like yeah. a co corporate culture, if you're in like very different countries and don't have like a shared sort of any kind, like a very different frame of reference, it that's harder to foster. And so I think that for those reasons, uh, it'll be a while before you see international outflow of, of jobs that can be done remotely. But I know also, Adam has a lot of thoughts on that too. Also, generally, um, even complete evangelists like me never proposed a five-day remote working week every week. Uh, you know, we generally accepted that there would be one or two days of the week, perhaps, where people would travel in and meet. Not, not in every case, but, you know, to some degree. Um, on the other hand, um, uh, I think that um, it places a very interesting value on any international company where there's a very good culture of trust. So it delivers the biggest economic gains to those international organizations where there's very high trust and a very common sort of set of values uh, across that organization. So in Ogilvy, which generally has quite a strong culture from the, you know, from the founder onwards, um, I see this as being a, a, a fairly significant competitive advantage. The fact that I can call someone in Ogilvy, Bangalore and say, let's work on this together knowing that they will be fairly eager to help out um, without needing to get into any transactional business about payment um, is, is something I see as a, as a real opportunity for us to differentiate ourselves, in fact. And so, and, and, why the, and by the way, uh, one of the things we ought to remember, um, generally the political left gets very excited about migration, which is people moving from poorer countries to richer countries to seek enrichment. But we ought to remember, as well as the right to free movement, we should also consider the right of non-movement, which is a hell of a lot of people, for reasons of family, support network, whatever, don't actually want to go anywhere. So the fact that you can enrich people without them being forced to move from one country to another in order to do so, you know, it strikes me as potentially wonderful. And by the way, you know, white collar workers in very large cities uh, well, who are very well paid, if there's any class of people who probably deserve a bit of a hit, <laughs> okay, let's, let's be honest here, right? You know, a, a group of people who to some extent have been insulated by geography and circumstance from the really chill winds of competition. Let's face it, you know, nobody, you know, manufacturing moved to China. Why shouldn't 20% of my job move to Bangalore? Well, I can't really answer that one. Well, fair enough. I think that that's a uh, that's a very serious, a very serious issue to raise. But I think it's less. I view it sort of as less uh, like, hey, screw you too, pal, and more of being like optimistic. So if you look at the research on the impacts of the China shock, which is what we call mm. sort of the emergence of China as a global trading behemoth and the opening up of U.S. markets to competition and other developed country markets to competition with China. There are, there are some things we learn about that that should make us more optimistic about this. If you look at, and this all stems from the work of David Otter and others, if you look at the workers who were exposed to trade shock with China, the ones who suffered earnings and employment losses are all on the bottom of the wage distribution. The top one third of workers, if you look at their prior earnings, their earnings before the China shock arrived, if you look at what happened to them after the China shock, they re reallocated just fine. So for skilled, educated workers, um, things worked pretty much like you th would think they would in the like Econ 101 textbook, which is everyone reallocated, there's higher productivity growth, sort of win-win scenario. It was really about low-skilled workers that struggled to, uh, to find new working opportunities. And so when we're talking about the effects of globalized uh, work for white-collar workers, to me, I think they're going to actually be more like the top the top third, where they're going to reallocate just fine to the extent it happens. The other thing that we know from that literature is place-based. So it's not just workers who are most educated that reallocated best, it's places that are more educated reallocated best. So if you are a worker of any skill level, 
working in a labor market where there was a lot of human capital, you had a much easier time finding new work than if you were, lived in a very you know, low skilled, low human capital place. Um, now, I think part of this is demographic that those places are faster growing. And so you have a place where it's you know, generally well off. You have lots of entrepreneurs around who can help figure out how to put people to work you know, who can take advantage of the sort of disruption that's happening, those are places where workers are gonna be just fine. And so I look at New York and San Francisco, and I say those places, if they're gonna be hit with this sort of global trade shock, um, I think they're gonna be just fine, especially because you have these massive chunks of land rents to be bid down and, you know, everything to reallocate just fine. The other thing I would say about this is that, um, you know, global trade is a two-way street and U.S. workers, are the highest skilled, most productive workers in the world. They, when you're talking about, um, you know, knowledge work, we lead the world in Nobel prizes. We have the highest output per hour, aside from, you know, the occasional micro state, we have the highest output per hour. Um, you know, we lead the world in all sorts of measures of innovation and stuff. Where does that come from if not our human capital? And so that makes me optimistic that when you open up global trade in skilled services, U.S. workers aren't going to be in the same position as the lowest skilled ones were when we opened up trade in low skilled manufacturing, which is this is an area of competitive advantage for our country and our workers. And I just I find it so hard to imagine that when we opened up low skilled trade, U.S. workers couldn't compete and we open up high skilled trade and then U.S. workers can't compete. Well, what in the world is our productivity made of? What is it made of if we can't compete anywhere along the skill distribution? So I'm relatively optimistic there. And I also agree with what Matt says about a lot of the sort of the sand in the gears here that'll prevent you from everything from being sort of frictionless instantly. If you look at David, Bl um, uh, if you look at Alan Blinder's research uh, in 2004 through 2007, he was, there, he was one of the first people to start thinking about what are the implications of remote ability of work for labor markets. And he had this totally pessimistic prediction that all these jobs are going to be offshored. Now, if you take, he produced these occupation specific offshoring risk scores. Now, if you look at these offshoring risk scores and what's happened in the decades since then, those jobs have not gone, had slower job growth. So it doesn't seem that they've been offshored to a damaging extent. What they have done is they've gone remote. So what he saw is offshore ability turned out to be remote ability. And basically, if you think of remoteness, remote ability is like, here's the United States in like 1970, zero remote ability. And here's the United States in 2030, when we've achieved like maximum remote ability. To walk from no remote ability to remote ability requires equalizing opportunity within the United States to a much stronger extent. So if we eventually arrive at the point where it's super easy to hire anyone in the world to do anything whatsoever, and we've gotten over these cultural time zone and language barriers through technology, to have gotten to that point, we will have walked through the point where it's easier to hire anyone in the US. And I believe that the United States with a much more even geography of opportunity, where you take the places that have been left behind and are struggling and you make them more equal with the rest of the country, that's a country that overall is much more capable of adapting to global competition of things going increasingly remote because you have this, you have so much more underlying strength. And I really think it is an underlying weakness that causes us to not be able to respond well to trade shocks. And to, to have this, you know, remote work will deliver all these equalizing benefits before it ever starts to deliver these sort of, um, if you might, you know, excessive costs of ex extreme trade. So that's my that's my optimistic take on all of that. The, I would I would say that to the you know hundred million fluent English speakers in India, this is going to be pretty good news. Um, and uh, you know potentially. Um, I I think it I think it is very interesting. I mean I think one of the interesting things I suppose is that there was an element of boiled frog to this, wasn't there, in that. We were slow to spot the potential, partly because when I started work, I'm probably, I'm, I think I'm older than everybody by about 10 years, uh, at least on the call. And I started work in 1988 um, and 90% of what I did had to be done in the office. 
and 50 to 60 percent of it had to be done at a specific time in you know coordinated with other people and then i suppose the mobile telephone um email bit by bit technologies came in and what i think's now happened is that video conferencing has kicked that below 50 percent you know the proportion of work now you can argue whether it's 10 or whether it's 40 but it's inarguably below 50 percent of the actual work i perform requires my presence in a specific place at a specific time and that 50 percent is probably a decisive tipping point isn't it because at that point you do start to ask well actually if the majority of what i do can be done remotely the default of doing everything in the office no longer really stands and if you think about, you know, information technology, which hasn't really delivered the productivity gains yet, which were promised, is that fair? You're the economists. But in some respects, the whole purpose of information technology is to make geography slightly redundant. You know, if you, if you were to generalise what the whole communications revolution has been about, it's to mean that, you know, in other words, you can pay your gas bill from a cafe in France. That, you know, that's the kind of thing... Uh, which, you know, is ultimately what, you know, the, the whole Silicon Valley project is about. If you were to give it a kind of, uh, you know, if you were to impose on, not that, it, not that it had that purpose, but that's the net effect. And if we don't take advantage of that by saying, you know, in other words, if the change from this revolution isn't what I say visible from the air, you know, the Industrial Revolution, its effects were visible from the air. You know, uh, the, the invention of the railways may, you know, you would have immediately spotted that there was an enormous increase in building some distance from central London. And if in the same way, the, you know, we end up with essentially the same aerial view of the world despite this revolution, then it hasn't really delivered until that point, has it? You know, until it changes where people live and work. Well, it can't really be counted alongside, you know, a technology like the railways or a technology like the washing machine, which, you know, arguably had huge impact because it allowed women uh, to enter the workforce much more easily. I think you want to see it in the world. And I think you also want to see it in the productivity statistics. Yeah. So Bob Solo had the famous quote, I think it was late 1980s, where he said, you know, you can see the Internet revolution everywhere except productivity statistics. But it did come. It came in the late 1990s up through 2004. We had really strong productivity growth. And a lot of that was due to the IT revolution. So I don't think the IT revolution ever happened. I just think it took a lot of time. And I think you're right that there are parallels here with remote work. My question for Matt as you know, a scholar of innovation, is that in general how things go? There's this sort of lag between potential and then adoption and then actual productivity gains? Yeah, it's, it's 100%. So they, uh, there's even a recent paper that's about artificial intelligence, and they call like the J-curve, because you go through this period of re, redoing, refiguring out your processes to take advantage of the new technology. And like back when they went from the, uh, you know, when they invented the steam engine, you had to figure out how to move from the cottage industry to a factory, and there was all these transitions and stuff. And then when you went to electricity, you had to re- uh, change how you do the layout of the factory because you no longer needed the central axis and these five-story buildings and everybody was like tied to this thing and the productivity gains came when those when people built new factories that were optimized for this new technology then the ICT revolution you, uh, you know it took a decade or more after it came in for people to figure out how to I don't know use Excel and email effectively in their in, in their industry then artificial intelligence and then I think it's like 100% the same thing with remote work. Uh, it's just remote work is unusual in that we have this COVID thing, which is suddenly, that's why I thought this was going to take a very long time to play out because it usually does. And you're going to see, if there hadn't been COVID, you would have had some companies that started, they tried 100% remote, more people noticed that it works very well for them. And then you just sort of get this slow bubbling up, maybe a certain industry like a niche becomes is like mostly remote and then it spills over to another as people transfer. Like that's what it would have normally been, but now we've got this rapid transition. And I do wonder also if like, we're going to have a bit more backlash than we normally would if we had had this very slow move over. But I think ultimately like, you know, that's where it's going to be. 
it's going to change the shape of how we live. Uh, there was also an interesting on. problem, which is social and psychological, which is that nobody could say out loud how much of a pay cut they'd accept in order to in order to uh, work remotely. So there was a kind of game theory problem that you couldn't be the first mover to say, tell you what, I'll take it. Nobody wanted to be the first person to do that. Now, I had a very interesting story, someone very, very senior in banking in London who um, who kind of took early retirement and spent four, four days of the week in France and came back to London for three days every week. And he had a few non-executive directorships and so on. And then sure enough, unsurprisingly, after about two years, people came to him with insanely generous job offers. And he told me, he said, I sat down and I thought, how much money would you have to pay me in order for me no longer to be able to spend four days of the week in France? He said, finally came, said, funnily enough, he said, there is no amount of money. Now, he had the advantage of being fairly rich already. That wouldn't apply to someone who's 25 and, you know, and, and, and fairly skint. But nonetheless, it is interesting that the value um, is, is, a, is, is the value to the employee is one that you almost have to be slightly secretive about because of the fear of weakening your negotiating position. So people might be reluctant to say how great it is. I, I find it spectacular in terms of productivity in most respects, um, partly because just the cognitive load of commuting, never mind the time, I worked out that in order to start work in the office, I have to perform something like 207 operations just to get from being in bed at home to being in the office, finally typing in my password and logging in. And the same thing if you work from home is about five operations. Uh, you put a cardigan on over your pajamas, which is a bit, it's a bit of a male trick, but generally that'll pass muster. You know, you can, you can wake up five minutes before the first meeting of the day, put a cardigan on over your pajamas, log in, you're good to go. And just the, cog I suddenly realized just the incredible cognitive effort of making a journey every single day before you can start work is pretty spectacular. You know, have I charged my phone? Do I, you know, remember to put your phone in your pocket? And funnily enough, technology's made that worse in a funny kind of way. You know, the amount of complexity required to leave the house um, has gone up and up because you need to be prepared for everything. And the ability also to, um, were, I, I, I was an early experimenter with this because I had a PA who was a single mum. And being a kind of Adam Smith person, you know, I said, okay, how do we maximize the value exchange here? And she's, you know, she said, well, you know, I said, look, to be honest, if you want to take your son to school and you're not in the, in the office um, until 10 o'clock, it doesn't bother me at all. I said, the one thing I'd like to do before 10 o'clock is be able to phone you up. And to be honest, I'd rather you were walking your son to school and I could phone you and say, where the hell is this meeting? Than you were traveling on the underground and I couldn't reach you, you know, at nine o'clock. And then I used to, we, we got into an interesting arrangements, like I'd post my expenses to her home because she liked to do them in the evening after her son had gone to sleep. And so we did this whole thing of just effectively saying, I can't necessarily give you more money and I can't necessarily give you more free time. But what I can do is give you a hell of a lot of autonomy over the where and the when. And I suddenly realised this was a really important value exchange. You know, if ever there was a day where her son had a school play or a sports day, I said, absolutely fine. You know, off you go. Meanwhile, then at eight o'clock that evening, she'd be doing work, replying to my emails because her son had gone to sleep. And that was the best use of her time, was to devote the time late in the evening. Great. And my view is that the whole point of bloody free market capitalism is that it makes for more intelligent exchange of value. And that isn't just between customer and seller. It should be between employer and employee. You know, we should work out the way in which, essentially, the value exchange is optimised so that everybody can deliver the most value at the lowest cost. And by the way, there's, there's a fantastic added benefit to this, okay, which is autonomy is the one form of wealth that no one knows how to tax. <laughs> okay, so, right, okay, there are loads of benefits. I could give my employees perks, I could give them this or that, okay. If I give them autonomy and say, actually, to be honest, you haven't got any physical meetings next week, why don't you work from Marbella, okay? <laughs> right, huge benefit. Tax implications, zero. <laughs> Look at it like that as well. It's the most tax efficient form of reward. 
And I think you were saying how much, oh, go ahead, Adam. The, the way that this negotiation plays out with you and your employee and the opportunities that open up, I think are really illustrative kind of goes back to what Matt said, you know, this experiment's happened so fast. It's happened overnight and there's going to be a lot of people, there's going to be blowback as a result because 50% of people are working remote right now. I'm a, very much an optimist, but 50% of people aren't going to be working remote in 2022, right? It's going to be some number between where it was and 50%. And so every single person who goes back to the office is going to be a wall street journal story. Oh my gosh. Did you guys hear, uh, you know, um, Google, they bought a new office. Remote work is dead. It's like, of course, well, there, there's going to be people going back to the office. So we're going to have this steady stream of stories. But I think that the thing that that's going to happen more slowly is that people take the time to sort of learn how this works best and renegotiate the terms of their employment. And, you know, it's a whole, opens up all these different opportunities for the, the kind of things that Rory brings up. And like those things take time to figure out and it, all this potential has been opened up. And it's going to take time to sort of work out how to make the best use of it. And so I think that we will have sort of this immediate blowback, but I think that then a lot of it's just going to be kind of fake news, like, you know, inevitable you're, it's coming anyway. And I think that, um, you, you know, but we're, what we're also going to have is a sort of longer run, slower people learning to make the best of this and doing things and working in ways that are, you know, much better for everyone. And it just takes time to figure out what those ways are. Flexibility is part of it. Working everywhere is part of it. Entirely remote companies who start from scratch as remote is part of it. And those things are going to take time to evolve. And they're going to be sort of positive effects that we don't see immediately. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I was just going to say when you asked how much, uh, we don't know how much people will take a pay cut to work remote. Like well, I, there are some studies. And uh, if you can work from home, it's like 8%. Uh, but if you can work from anywhere, that's, that hasn't really been done. And, uh, but people value the freedom to live, for example, near their family. And like I said, like the, uh, people who rate themselves as highly mobile in the US, they did this experiment and they still would take like a $20,000 pay cut to live near friends and family. At least that was the average response uh, in one of these studies. And yeah, and then as to Adam's point, I totally agree. I think that this is another reason that this was a longer time coming is that there's this, there's a lot of learning that happens outside just even the firm. Like I think a generation that grows up online and learns how to communicate informally over text is, is sort of an important part of it. And people getting comfortable with the norms of video conferencing. Like before we started this, I, I had a really bad backlit thing. And so I changed it around, but I know, I know how to address these problems now and all these little, Little things that just make the interestingly, uh, all yeah. three of us are wearing headphones because we've learned that's much more immersive. Because a significant part of this, by the way, is not only video, it's quality audio. Yes, yeah. Um, because the telephone was designed for an age of very restricted bandwidth, and therefore, other than intelligibility, it strips out almost every other form of you know nuance in spoken communication. And so, the standard phone call is rather a bad thing. Um, the other interesting thing here, of course, is that the loss aversion, now people have seen this, uh, is interesting because it's a little like that John Locke thought experiment about, the, you know, the prisoner in the locked room who isn't aware that he's being held prisoner. And previously, when we had to travel in four days a week or five days a week into the office, we weren't aware that it was an imposition just as John Locke's prisoner wasn't aware that he was a prisoner because he'd been, what was it, drugged and, you know, entertained and placed in an incredibly pleasant environment without being aware that the door was locked. And now, of course, everybody who's experienced this is aware of the locked door. We know there's a door. And we're going to be that bit more reluctant. And it's a bit like, how will you keep them down on the pod farm now that they've seen Paris? You know, that old World War I song, post-World War I song. People have had a glimpse of this. And they're going to be... And, and they've also had confirmed that it basically works. And even I wasn't sure that it could work at scale. I knew it could work for me. And I thought it could work for my team of 15 people. I never really thought it could work at the scale it did. And so once we've now had that glimpse, we're not going to actually, you know, um, retreat 
all that readily, I think. Another thing, by the way, in the US, which is probably, I'll give you two more tips for the investor, okay? As well as being close to family, climate in the US is going to be, in, in the UK, we're a piddly little place, and it doesn't make that much difference climatically where you live. In the US, I'd guess that southern places or places like Denver are going to benefit disproportionately in terms of where people choose to live. Uh, that'd be definitely one element. The other one, um, and this is a wonderful thing about working on an ad agency, because I was just joking that I was looking for office accommodation for Ogilvy on the coast. Uh, and immediately I said, why don't we create a co-working space for coastal property? And immediately my colleague, Jim Pryor, who's one of the great branding gurus said, we ought to call it Sea Work. Now, interestingly, I'll give you a very interesting property tip. OK, if you divide the whole population of the UK um, equally among its land mass, OK, everybody gets about two thirds of an acre each. Very densely populated country, not as dense as the Netherlands, but two thirds of an acre is kind of all right, isn't it? If you divide the coastline of the UK among the population, you get three quarters of an inch each. Now, if you but take my assumption that there is an inherent human desire to live by the sea or lakeshore, that's the property to invest in because that's where the scarcity really lies. If you take away agglomeration effects, the new scarcity is coastline. Totally agree. I'm on a lake right now. You're on the lake. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> You've done it. You cracked it. <laughs> Great guys, this has been such a fascinating discussion. It's been a real testament to Sutherland's law that we can draw in some of like people I've been listening to or reading for, for you know, maybe decades, in, in your case, Rory, I guess, uh, not de decade rather than decades. Uh, but, you know, people I've been following for so long, we just bring them in in probably the space of about two weeks, we organized all of this. Uh, and that really shows the wonder of uh, remote work. So I thought, uh, We've, we've sort of overran our slot. I realized that uh, Matt's uh, Charles has now finished watching the Lego movie. So <laughs> perhaps his time will no longer be, uh, <laughs> his time is now more at, at a premium for other reasons. Um, so thanks everyone for joining. I thought I'd just leave it, leave it over to Matt for sort of a few closing remarks, uh, just to sort of sum up, give, give, a, give us a bit more of a taste of the research and uh, you know, what what any if there are any points that you thought uh, hadn't been touched on that are, that are in the paper that are worth looking out for no i think i think the we've covered a lot of it but i would just say like we've said people tend to focus on comparing the experience being commute working with your coworkers uh, over zoom to being in the office they don't like the zoom and so they think well remote work is never going to work but there's all these, it's not about this one-to-one -one comparison. There's all these other benefits to remote work that you, you don't get. And so you don't see if you just do this one-to-one. -one. If you think of it as only like, I'm doing my office job, but I'm doing it at home, talking to my coworkers over a video phone, then yeah, it doesn't maybe seem that revolutionary. It, you have to bring in the freedom to live in different places, how you change your life, uh, how it changes the kind of employees you work with and so on. And I think once you... And Bring future technologies, by the way, which is one of the great technological failings, is that there, there isn't an easy way of doing Zoom calls on a 65-inch 4K TV. Yeah. You can, Facebook has something called the portal, but they're mostly not interoperable. Now, those technologies are going to be appearing, including, by the way, for high-status-seeking high business people, there's going to be a kind of Leica or a Nikon video conferencing suite costing four grand, isn't there? That's going yeah. to be on the market in two years' time. So that will accelerate things as well, I think. And yeah, the last thing is just that the experience of remote work during COVID is sort of like the worst of all worlds uh, because it's like social distancing, it's rushed, it's not with this new technology. And I think it's like, it's going to get better than it is now. And it's already, people are finding pretty good. Great. Thanks everyone <laughs> for, for joining us. Uh, great. See, see you guys. Uh, thanks a lot. Let's stay in touch. I've so much enjoyed this. This has been really fantastic. And I think the paper's fantastic. <laughs>